tonight we have Andre talking about animal testing. Um, thank you very much, first of all, to Caroline McAleese for organising this. And uh, to Eddie, modest Eddie, sitting in the back. Um, just, just so I didn't organise it, I just contacted you. Just yeah. to she, so she's so modest as well. It's a Bristol trade. Okay. So, lovely to be here. I'm from Kent. But as you can tell, I don't have a Kentish accent. Uh, and those of you who think I'm South African are actually wrong because it's a, it says Zimbabwean accent. So I was born in Belgium, lived uh, half my life in Africa and half in the Middle East, and for the last seven years I've been um, in the beautiful UK. I studied zoology and veterinary medicine in South Africa and came across animal experimentation, which I thought was horrible, but every time I debated a medical doctor, the doctor would say, look, I love animals, but I love babies even more. And I really didn't have an answer to that. And that's what forced me to look for a scientific argument. And that's what I've been doing for the past <coughs> 30 years. And I won't say I have all the answers, but I, ha I certainly have a lot of answers. So, so the, the topic tonight is, does animal testing slow down medical progress? Um, now, I'd like to kick off with a really practical question. Uh, and this is, this is a, a true life Example, I'm not making this up. So if I was to offer you £2,000 to take one injection of an experimental drug and let me take a few blood samples from you every few hours, so all, all you have to give up is one day, take one injection for £2,000, and just to make you feel better, to make you feel quite secure, I will tell you that this drug has been tested on monkeys at 500 times the dose that I'm going to give it to you. Now, would, would any of you like to get the 2,000 pounds? Any, any offers? There we go. Maybe. Okay. Okay, well, well thank goodness that you didn't um, actually take part in this. This is, of course, the Northwick Park medical trial that took place in the UK in March 2006, where six healthy young men took part in a clinical trial for an experimental drug called TGN 1412, which is for arthritis, it's for certain autoimmune conditions. All six young men ended up in intensive care. One of those six young men swelled up so much he was called the elephant man. He lost most of the ends of his fingers and his toes. Um, and all six showed early signs of lymphoma, which is cancer of the white blood cells for 2,000 pounds. So I think, I think your life is worth a lot more than 2,000 pounds. So, so that's a real life example of what we're talking about. But what exactly does drug development entail? Well, to develop a new drug will cost a pharmaceutical company about half a billion pounds. It'll take 10 to 12 years. They will look at about 10,000 molecules. Out of those 10,000 molecules, um, about 100 will be tested on animals. And out of those 100, 10 will enter clinical trials. Now, clinical trials is just a nice word of saying animal experimentation. But, uh, I beg your pardon, human experimentation. But human experimentation sounds terrible, so they call it clinical trials. It sounds much better. So clinical trials involves phase one, two, three, and four. Phase one is the use of healthy human individuals. Phase two and three are actual patients. Phase four is you and me, the public. Now, by the time a drug has been tested on phase one, two, and three, it will have been tested at most on about three and a half thousand people. So if you are that unlucky one in 4,000 who's gonna have a bad reaction to that drug, they won't pick it up during the clinical trials. So that's to give you some sort of idea of what clinical trials entail. Now, I've been in the animal rights movement for many, many years, and I've seen the sort of the, the to and fro, the animal rights movement 
pointed a finger at the pharmaceutical industry and said, hey, you're the bad guys. You're using animals. You're testing chemicals on animals. And these animals are suffering and dying. And the pharmaceutical industry said, no, we're not the bad guys. It's the Home Office. It's the regulatory authorities. They are the bad guys. Go to them. Go to speak to them. So we went and spoke to the regulatory authorities. And the regulatory authorities turned around and said, no, we're not the bad guys either. All we ask the pharmaceutical industry is to prove, before they put a drug on the market, that A, it is safe, and B, that it works. How they do that is largely up to them. Of course, we will accept animal data. We're quite happy to accept animal data. But hey, if they want to use you know, something else, that's fine. And so for many years, we were, we were sent from one to the other, each one passing the buck. But if you analyze this carefully, it, it really comes down to, to money, I would say. Uh, the law says that before you put a drug on the market, you must test it on a rodent and a non-rodent species. The rodent species is usually the rat. The non-rodent species is usually the beagle dog. Um, why the rat and the beagle? Well, hey, rats are plentiful. Uh, no problem. Uh, beagle dogs, because they are friendly, they are not too small, not too big. They won't bite your hand after you do horrible things to them. So really, that's, that's the reason. That's not scientific at all. Um, the laws requiring animal testing are about 50 years old. And they are the same laws in existence today. Science has moved forward by about 50 years. But the laws have not yet caught up with the science. And that's not an accident. It suits the pharmaceutical industry and the chemical industry and the pesticide industry and the cosmetics industry to use animals because they can then cherry pick the strain or the species of animal that gives them the result that they want. Okay, they can choose between about 250 different strains of rat. They can choose between about <coughs> 330 different strains of mouse. If you pay me in the right pocket, I will prove to you that this drink is healthy. If you pay me in the other pocket, I will prove to you the exact opposite. All I need to do is pick and choose the animal strain to prove my point. Now, you can't do that if you use human cells. If you start using human cell lines, you get pretty much one answer. And that's, that's medical progress. It's <coughs> happening, not fast enough, but it's happening. The situation today is a pharmaceutical company that wants to put a drug onto the market has to produce animal data. That's, that's the law. They must produce animal data. If they want to produce human data, they can do so. It's voluntary. It's not obligatory. I, I can't make sense of that. We're talking about a human drug. It must be tested on animals, but it doesn't have to be tested on human cells. To me, that's crazy. But it's not an accident. Uh, animal testing gets it right about 30% of the time. In other words, if I take 10 different animal species which are used in laboratories to test drugs, on average, 3 out of 10 will respond like a human being. On average, 3 out of 10 will respond like a human being. That's a 33% success rate. Now, I didn't make that figure up. Those figures are thanks to data from the pharmaceutical industry comparing the toxic effects of a chemical or a drug on an animal and then comparing it to the adverse drug reaction seen in people. So the correlation is somewhere around 33% hey, that's worse than tossing a coin. If you toss a coin, you get a 50% success rate. So animal testing is actually worse. It's less scientific, it's less reliable than tossing a coin. Once the public get that, they'll say, you know, hop, you know just stop animal testing. That's, that's the message, okay? We have, we have the atomic bomb. We have the ammunition to stop animal experimentation overnight. Our problem is how do you communicate this to the general public? Whenever I come up against an animal researcher on television or on the radio, and we each have 20 seconds for a sound bite, my opponent will say in 20 seconds, if it wasn't for animal experiments, we wouldn't have insulin, antibiotics, heart transplants, vaccines. That's it. He's, he's had his sound bite. I, in 20 seconds, cannot undo that. 
It's not an accident. The pro-vivisection lobby want to keep this debate, this discussion, as superficial as possible. It's either your dog or your child. Animal experimentation is a necessary evil. That's the message that they are projecting, that they have projected for years and years. The media love that. And a 10-year-old child can understand that. If I, for me to undo that and to start talking about pharmacogenomics and toxicogenomics and, and all sorts of complex non-animal methods, first of all, I cannot do that in 20 seconds. And secondly, I cannot explain that to a 10-year-old child. I need somebody with some sort of, with some science background. Now, you may be interested to know that out of 650 MPs in the UK government today, one has a background in, in biological sciences. One. Um, most MPs learn their science from the newspapers. That's where they get their knowledge. Everybody sitting here tonight, I would say, is more knowledgeable about animal experimentation than the average politician because you're more up-to-date on it. Okay, just to give you one example of what I'm talking about. The pharmaceutical industry today recognizes what we call personalized medicine. So we're all different, okay? Everybody in this room is different because of your genes. Okay, so some people will get drunk faster than others based on your genes. Some people in this room will react badly to penicillin because you're allergic to penicillin. Others won't. Okay? So the pharmaceutical industry have realized that it's no longer 500 milligrams three times a day for everybody in this room. We've got to take into account your, your personal, individual DNA. And so instead of one medis medicine for the whole room, we're going to have to produce ten variations of this based on uh, people's gender, people's age, uh, your ethnic background, etc., etc. Um, so that's actually, from the pharmaceutical uh, company's perspective, that's a win-win situation because it means fewer adverse drug reactions, which means you'll have more confidence um, to buy their products. So it's a bit more of a hassle to produce 10 variations of the same drug, but it's, it's a sort of a win-win situation. And that's the way the pharmaceutical industry is going. So that's progressive. The cosmetics industry is looking for non-animal methods because of consumer pressure, which is a good thing. So in the pharmaceutical industry, the cosmetics industry, I would say things are progressing. The problem is the chemicals industry. The chemicals industry, the last thing they want to find out is what you're allergic to, what chemicals you're allergic to. Because if they have to stop using rats, and start using human cells, I would say that about 95% of the chemicals in our environment will have to go out the window. The reason that you and I have about 230 chemicals in our bodies that shouldn't be there is because they've all been tested on animals and passed as safe, quote unquote. Uh, so that suits the chemicals industry. Um, and that's bad news for the cosmetics industry because 90% of the chemicals in cosmetics are industrial chemicals, folks. And so the chemical industry is terrified that we will replace all animal testing in the cosmetics industry because you can use those very same non-animal methods used to test cosmetics and apply them to the chemical industry. They don't want that. And they are doing their utmost to slow down the development and the implementation of non-animal methods. I just want to say one thing about clinical trials. Okay, animal experimentation doesn't work. Let's throw it out the window. Clinical trials also needs to be revisited. Um, I'm personally against the use of healthy human individuals in phase one clinical trials. Why on earth do you want to give a healthy individual a medication that's never been tested before on anybody else? That person is putting themselves at risk. They don't know what the risk is. If you take part in a clinical trial, you have to sign a form, you have to sign on the dotted line, a document of informed consent. Now what you are giving when you sign is legal consent, but you're not giving valid consent. Valid consent 
would mean that you know what you're letting yourself in, in for, but you don't know what you're letting yourself in for. Now, the pharmaceutical industry, not by chance, when they test a drug for the first time, they choose young white men between the ages of 25 and 35, average height and weight, non-smokers. Why white men? Because white men have fewer side effects than blacks, A Asians, and Chinese. Why men? Because men have fewer side effects than women. Okay, so it's not accidental. Um, there are heart drugs that have been tested in men that have killed women. Okay, there are heart drugs that are four times more potent in women than in men. So there are very good reasons um, not just to test in men. But I would say stop testing on healthy people. The people who need medication are sick people. So if I had two weeks to live and the doctor said to me, I've got a new drug, um, would you like us, you know, you've got two weeks to live, do you want to try? Well, I would say I've got two weeks to live, I've got nothing to lose. Uh, if you've tested it on animals, don't waste my time because I don't trust animal testing. But if you've tested it on human cell lines, human cell culture, human organ slices, computer modeling, then I'm interested. And if it works for me, then give it to somebody who's got a month to live. And if it works for them, give it to somebody who's got six months to live. 90% of the drugs on the market today are what is known as Me Too drugs. They are not significantly safer uh, or more effective than existing drugs. And that's simply for patents. It's nothing to do with human health. It's just simply to keep patents going. So, you know, the World Health Organization estimates that in order for a society to have basic medical care, we need about 250 drugs. And the drug at the top of the list is aspirin. 250. We can get by on 250 drugs. If you look at the British medical formulary, there are about 18,000 preparations in there. Way too much. Every time you put a new drug on the market, it's new adverse drug reactions. It's new side effects. So if a doctor says to me, got a new drug that's just come out, do you want to try it? I would say no. Rather give me something that's been on the market for a long, long time, you know exactly what the side effects are. Today we can go one step further than that. We can look at your DNA. There are about 18 drugs in the United States today that you will not be prescribed until the doctors have taken a sample of your DNA and worked out whether this suits you or not. I'll give you an extreme example of what I'm talking about. Two monozygotic twin ladies. So we're talking about identical twins. At the age of 35, each discover they have breast cancer. They go to hospital and the DNA of that cancer is analyzed. And lo and behold, there are tiny differences in the DNA of those two sisters. And as a result of that, they each get different chemotherapy. So if one identical twin sister cannot predict the kind of cancer or the treatment of her identical twin sister, how on earth is a rat going to predict what's going to happen in people? Okay. I want to, I want to stop there. I want to thank you very much for your attention. And please you know throw questions at me if you if you have this is you know i've come all the way from kent please uh, exploit me thank you <laughs> normally people are very shy to ask the first question so i kick off by asking the first question and i say if you had to have your appendix removed and you could choose between a doctor who done it a hundred times in dogs or five times in people which one would you choose? <laughs> okay, well you've got the answer right. And usually when I ask this question to in schools, because I do a lot of school talks, they usually get it right. They don't know why they got it right. But, but the answer is simple, because dogs don't have an appendix. <laughs> so. Yes, I think that um, we live in a, a pill-popping society. Uh, prevention is not a money spinner. Prevention is not a money spinner. And therefore, the, the emphasis is on curing people. Uh, but I think, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, let your food be your medicine. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's sort of common sense rules. 
you know, about keeping your weight down, exercising, avoiding animal fat and saturated fats, not smoking if, if possible. Um, th those are just common sense, common sense rules. So, yes, I think, um, and also, if you have a choice between surgery or medication, um, if, if the surgeon gets it wrong, it's, some, it's, it's more difficult to repair. So, you know, get a second opinion or a third opinion. And if you can try something less invasive, if you can try something, um, I mean, I, I personally like homeopathy, I like naturopathy. Uh, I think fasting is a wonderful thing. Whenever animals get sick, the first thing they do is they stop eating. Um, so that all those, really what we need to do is, is, is to go back to nature, is to go back to uh, sort of the primitive state. Uh, listen to your body. Um, you know, people say to me, what is natural? You know, we've forgotten what natural is. Well, well actually, all you need to do is look inside. If you look at your cells, all of your cells work 24-7. Um, they only take the food that they need or the energy that they need, no more than that, and they work for us 24-7 without taking a break. Now, if they get sick, if something goes wrong, the first thing they do is they stop multiplying. So they don't pass on the damage to their daughter cells. And they try and repair the damage in any way they can. And if they cannot repair the damage, they commit suicide. That's called apoptosis in science. So as not to harm the surrounding cells. So as to maintain... So that's, that's altruism <coughs> at the cellular level. So, so to me, that is a wonderful example of going back to your roots and, and seeing what, you know, what is natural behavior. What is it to be natural again? Have I not answered your question? Um, well, you, you have. In a roundabout way. I was thinking of things like uh, Bob Beck's uh, electrical zapper, which um, you know, a virus is to operate on certain frequencies and certain structures. So you, if you resonate with them with the right frequency, they'll fall apart. And then you know, you potentially sort of cure cancer that way. And you can't do anything you to cure you know, cancer, a lot of diseases we have already. But you know, they're, they're surprised. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so what I would say to that is that because we are all different, we all have to find what works for each of us. So somebody will say, you know, I went on a tomato diet and it sorted me out. And somebody else will say, you know, I'm allergic to tomatoes. So find what works for you because we're all different. Because we're all different. And what works for you may work for your neighbor, but it may not. So I think we have to, we have to tune into ourselves find what works for us, listen to our bodies, listen to our bodies, and, and what works for us is great. And, you know, obviously tell your friends and say, this worked great for me, try it, and if it works for you, fantastic. If not, well, it's because we're different. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of got a feeling that we're facing, um, those coronavirus things are going to be And I totally agree. And that's why, that's why we shouldn't wait for the laws to be changed. We need to act right now. Um, protect yourself, your family, by making, making sure that the water you drink is pure. I mean, you don't know what comes out of your tap water. Um, try and eat organic as much as possible. Don't wait for the, you know, for the European Union to ban pesticides. It's not going to happen. Certainly not in our lifetime, I wouldn't think. Um, in fact, let me give you an example. Um, the, the Scandinavian countries banned paraquat many years ago. Paraquat is a nasty herbicide. A nasty herbicide. Um, and the, Swe the Swedish government said to the European Union, why don't you ban this across, across Europe? And the European Union turned around and said, well, according to the manufacturer, which was Zeneca, as in AstraZeneca, um, you know, the stuff's fine. And then the Swedish government produced evidence linking paraquat to Parkinson's disease. And they won in court. They forced the European Union, the European Commission, to ban paraquat 
across the board. That's one happy example. I straight away contacted the Swedish government and I said, who is this lawyer? I want him. <laughs> they said, well, he's been forced to retire. <laughs> so, you know, occasionally a gem comes up and they, they quickly get him out the way before he causes too much trouble. But at least that was, that's, that's one rare good example of, you know, effective uh, campaigning, if you like. Any other questions? Um, ladies first. You're a lady. Sure. Um, um, you mentioned the Northwick Park disaster where um, there were some young men who <coughs> took a drug, were given a drug that was tested on a range of animals and had some disastrous consequences. Are there any other examples? There must be loads of examples like that. But I wonder whether you could think about it. It's just that um, that's some, you know, that, that, that the Northwick Park one cited quite a bit. But I wonder if you knew of any others. Okay. Okay. A very, a very well-known example is Vioxx. Vioxx is an anti-arthritic drug um, which was a blockbuster drug. When I say blockbuster, it brought in billions. You must understand that the profits in the pharmaceutical industry are not measured in millions, they are measured in billions. And they've got very good statisticians who work out that if you make a billion or a few billion from your blockbuster drug <coughs> and then after a few years you have to take it off the market because of adverse drug reactions, um, you, can, you can absorb those, those um, litigation suits for a few reasons. Because, first of all, some of the people who have, who have died already, so they can't sue you. The people who are injured, you try and take on the pharmaceutical industry. Not easy, in court, not easy. But let's say you do. Let's say you form a group and you launch a class action suit. Um, it's very easy to cause a bit of infighting within that group because what you can do is you can say to someone, hey, I'll give you 10,000 pounds and let's just call it quits. And some of the people in that group who are launching the class action are desperate for money. And to them, 10,000 pounds is exactly what they need to, to sort out their mortgage. And they'll say yes. Whereas the other people say, no, 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 no. You know, one million, no less. And so what you do is you cause infighting. There's all sorts of clever tricks. So in the end, the pharmaceutical industry will, will probably have to pay out a few million pounds. And when you consider that with the billions they've made, that, that makes good you know, mathematical sense, no problem. But to come back to Vioxx, Vioxx was described as the mother of all adverse drug reactions because Vioxx is estimated to have killed between 150 and 200,000 people worldwide through heart attack and stroke. Now the manufacturer of Vioxx, at the time was Merck, told the judge during the hearing that Vioxx was not only not bad for the heart, it was actually cardioprotective in mice. It actually protected the heart of mice. Now it's only when you get to court that you find out all the little details. And what often happens in court is the judge will say, I want to see all of your data. Give me all of your animal data. And lo and behold, we see that the drug company tested on 20 animals, got the result they wanted in two, the result they didn't want in 18. They just binned the 18 and chose the two. And that's what happens when you allow uh, a profit motive industry to regulate itself. In other words, the, the FDA or the MHRA says to the industry, hey, you're the experts, not, not us. We trust you. We believe you if you tell us that that strain of mouse is the, <coughs> the most appropriate mouse to be used. Um, when... when, when a pharmaceutical company wants to put a drug on the market, as I said to you before, they have to test it on a rodent and a non-rodent species. So they will test it on a rat and a dog. If they don't get the same result in the rat and the dog, if the data doesn't match, they quickly go back to the lab and they can switch the rat for another strain of rat or the rat for a mouse. They can switch the dog for a monkey or a ferret or a mini pig. They can do that. Once they get the two to match, once they get the rodent and the non-rodent to match, they can then proceed to phase one clinical trials, in other words, healthy volunteers. They then give the drug to the healthy volunteers. For the first time, they have now got human data. They look at their human data, they quickly compare it to the animal data. And if it doesn't fit the animal data, they quickly go back to the lab 
and switch species again until the human data, because the human data trumps animal data, of course. So they will switch animal species until the human data fits the animal data, and then they are allowed to go to phase two. Sorry, there was your next, I think. Okay, well, just as animal experiments do not predict adverse drug reactions, okay, because they are only 30% predictive, um, by the same token, we've probably lost a lot of valuable cures because we tested those drugs on animals and they were shown to be dangerous in animals. Okay? Um, for example, a lot of drugs that cause birth defects in animals do not cause birth defects in people. Now, there's a law called Karnofsky's Law in science, which says that if you give a drug at the right dose, at the right time, during pregnancy to an animal, any animal species, you will get side effects. You will get, um, I beg your pardon, you will get birth defects. You will get birth defects. So if we were to apply that, we would not have any drugs available, certainly not given to pregnant women. The only reason that there are fewer side effects today or fewer birth defects today is because of a thalidomide tragedy that happened in the 1960s of pregnant women who were given drugs that were tested on animals. No side effects were seen, no, no birth defects were seen, and then 10,000 babies without arms and legs were born. Now, the, the laws have not changed, folks. Today, the same regulations apply. If you want, if you want to get your drug onto the market, and the regulator says, what does this do to pregnant animals? They are still testing today on rats and rabbits. Those are the two species you have to test your drug on. So the laws have not changed. The only reason that there are fewer birth defects today is because doctors are far more careful, far more cautious and reticent to, to prescribe drugs for pregnant women because of thalidomide. Nothing to do with animal testing. <coughs> Can you say a bit more about alternative techniques to uh, that of animal testing? Okay. Um, people expect, when, 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 when a person goes for a, a pregnancy test or a person goes for an HIV blood test, that person expects the result to be about 100% correct. Now, when we say 100% correct, 100% predictivity, we mean that if the person has HIV, then the test will say, yes, 100% of the time, there is HIV. But if the person doesn't have HIV, we expect 100% of the time for that test to say, there is no HIV. So in other words, we don't want false positives and false negatives. So that is what we mean by prediction in science. Now, animal tests, as I said, get it right about 30% of the time, which is useless, worse than tossing a coin. Today, thanks to modern technology, thanks to DNA uh, tests thanks to human cells, human, human uh, cell culture, and so forth. We have tests that are, some tests are about 100% predictive, are about 100% predictive um, on, the, on the plus and on the minus side. That's, that's what we want. That's what we want. Um, now, even if a test is only 70% predictive, it's still twice as good as the animal data. It's still twice as good as the animal data. Okay? It's not easy to get 100% prediction. But even if it's 80% or 70%, it's way, way better than 30%. That's, that's a very important point. So if we want to test on a human, we, we're, we're, looking, about, we're looking at the, a, a human individual. So first of all, let's be species specific. Let's look at human cells, not dog cells, not mouse cells. Those are irrelevant. So let's start off with human cells. We have about 230 different cell types in our bodies today. It is possible to get any cell type that you want in order to experiment on. Okay, if you want skin cells, I'll get you skin cells. If you want liver cells, I'll get you liver cells. 100 grams of donated human liver um, is a piece of liver about that big that will yield 1 billion cells on which to experiment. So there's no shortage of human material, just a shortage of common sense. Where do we get human tissue from, people who have cancer and whose tumors are removed, um, those cells are 
multiplying forever. You can use those cells and you can select the cells that maintain sufficient characteristics of a normal cell because if those are the functions that you're interested in, you can still use those cancer cells. If you want normal cells, you just go to your local doctor, surgeon, uh, because any good surgeon, when they remove, uh, let's say, a skin cancer, they will always remove a little bit of healthy tissue around that to make sure they've got the whole thing out. So you can use those healthy cells. You can also get cells, primary cells, from biopsies. Um, you can get skin cells. The cosmetics industry uses a lot of foreskins. Okay, very, don't throw away foreskins. Very, very valuable for, for uh, skin testing, uh, skin cells. So you can get all these cell types. Now, people will say, yes, but you know, a single cell is not the same as a whole complex organism. Of course not. Okay, but a whole dog is not the same as a whole cat either. So again, I'm trying to push the animal experiments out the window. But we do have systems today that resemble, that mimic the human body. For example, if you think about when you swallow a tablet or a pill, that drug comes into contact first with your intestine. So you can have a sort of a set of compartments where you put your drug in at one end, it comes into contact with human intestinal cells, it then the metabolites of that go to the next compartment, which can consist of human blood cells, for example. And the metabolites of that will go into the next compartment, which contains human liver cells, and then human kidney cells. So we're starting to approach the complexity of the whole living organism. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, but it's way better than the animal. So that's, and again, let's talk about life-saving drugs. You know, we do not need more Me Too drugs. As I said to you before, earlier, 90% of the drugs on the market today are Me Too drugs. So if we're talking seriously about life-saving drugs, yeah, then yes, let's test it as I explained to you, and then offer it to somebody, a patient, not a healthy person, a patient who's got two weeks to live, <coughs> and you say to that person, We've tested this on everything known to science that's relevant to the human body. Are you, do you want to try it? And if that person has two weeks to live, I reckon they would say yes. And if it works for them, give it to somebody who's got a month to live, and so forth and so forth. Um, do you think it would be a lot more expensive to test on humans? Okay. Um, in the drug development process, which costs about half a billion pounds and takes 10 to 12 years, the proportion of the budget that goes to animal experiments is 1%. So that's negligible. The real cost are the clinical trials, and that accounts for 80%. 8 so by far the most expensive is clinical trials. The problem today, the pharmaceutical industry are crying out because they are losing drugs during clinical trials. So they've already spent a lot of money, a lot of money, and they are very upset because they are having to fail drugs late in clinical trials rather than early or even before clinical trials. And the way they are getting around this, they've woken up to the fact that, hey, if we test human DNA and use pharmacogenomics, we can, we can start getting better results and we will have fewer failures. And that's, that's what they are doing. And for, for us, from, a, from an animal rights perspective, that's good news. Because it means they have to use human DNA. There's no, there's no, you can't use mouse DNA. Okay, as I gave you the example of the, the identical twins. So, so that's, that's good news. So actually, it's going to, it's going to be a win-win situation for the, pharmaceutical, for the pharmaceutical industry if they use human DNA. Because it means personalized medicine, fewer adverse drug reactions. Uh, they're going to lose fewer drugs, and, and they're going to drop them earlier on. The bad ones, they're going to drop them earlier on. And also, it means that they will keep drugs that would have been thrown out because of animal toxicity. Because they won't be taking animal toxicity in, into account and only human DNA studies, it actually may give them drugs, good drugs, for people that normally they would have chucked out had they relied simply on the animal testing. Um, can I just say something and then ask a question? Of course you can. The first thing I want to say is that you mentioned <coughs> AstraZeneca and power play poisoning. And I'd just like to say that there are regular protests against AstraZeneca, which is based in Avon Mouth, and 
and that's why I still have more rights. And the second thing is, um, I work in the NHS, and we're talking about cost. I can't remember off the top of my head how much it costs our NHS per annum to put right all those adverse drug reactions. But I think we may be able to do that. Yeah, I think the figure is half a billion pounds. It's half a billion pounds. There are about 18,000 people in the UK who die from adverse drug reactions every year. Now, just to put 18,000 in perspective, that's about 60 jumbo jets crashing every year. So, if that was happening in the aviation industry, we'd all stop flying. It's happening in the pharmaceutical industry that people are simply not aware of it. And that's why they, you know, do what they do. But it's costing the NHS uh, about half a billion pounds a year. How long do you think it will take until uh, the animal testing will be replaced by the alternative uh, techniques? Okay, the question is how long do I think it will take before animal experiments are replaced by good science, by non-animal methods? Uh, that, I think, depends to a large extent on public opinion. Because at the moment, um, public opinion <coughs> thinks that animal experimentation is a necessary evil. Now, scientists like Dr. Ray Greek, who writes very, very good scientific articles against animal experimentation, it makes it very clear that animal experimentation doesn't work. So, so if you remove the unnecessary from the unnecessary evil, all that's left is evil, the public opinion can sweep away the evil. Our biggest problem is communication. As I said to you before, um, I, cannot, I cannot undo what an animal researcher gets across in a 20 second sound bite. I can't undo that in 20 seconds. Um, the media, the general media, are not interested in a scientific argument. I've attended a lot of animal rights demonstrations um, where I was asked to give a, a, a talk on why animal experiments don't work. And you know there were photographers there from the media, there were policemen, etc., etc. Not a word in the media. Not a word. However, if one protester attacks a policeman, then all the cameras start clicking. And that's what, that's what gets in the press. So our problem is communication. And thank goodness for social networking. Because that's how we can get around the, the mass media. Because they won't allow us to get this, this sort of message and other radical messages out there. I mean, can you imagine you know, where this would leave governments if, if the truth got out there? Um, or if the public was really educated about what's going on. So, you know, it's back, to, it's back to basics. It's back to leafleting. It's back to demos. It's back to street stalls, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. That works. I have a YouTube video for, of eight minutes, just eight minutes. Cost me nothing to produce. But I had a friend who invested a lot of time putting a lot of graphics in there. It's called Good Science Versus Bad Science. Um, and it's been seen by about 11,000 people so far in English, but it's in 10 languages. It's in 10 different languages, including Japanese, Spanish, Polish, French, Italian, you name it. So that is our way around the media, the standard media, because all their agenda at the moment is that if you are against animal experimentation, you must be a terrorist. You're either a scientist or a terrorist. There's nothing in between. Um, they will not... They, they are not interested in scientists like Dr. A. Greek or like myself who present the other side of the argument. We just will not get a hearing. So we have to do it by other means. And as I say, thank goodness for social networking. So, so that to answer your question, um, it all depends how fast the message gets out there. But I'm pleased to say that at least in, in um, the pharmaceutical industry and the cosmetics industry for different reasons, in the pharmaceutical industry, it's a profit motive that they want to use um, personalized medicine and stop the animal testing. And the cosmetics industry want to stop animal testing because of consumer pressure. Uh, so it's really the chemical industry that's going to hold this back, slow this thing down as much as possible. So, you know, it could take anything from, from 2 to 25 years. Uh, that all, it all depends on 
public opinion and public pressure. Because the, the non-animal methods are there. The pharmaceutical industry and the chemical in industry tomorrow could drop all the animal testing if they wanted to. But as I've explained to you, they don't want to because as long as they can keep cherry picking the animal species, they can continue putting products on the market that are not good for people and that they pass as safe on the back of animal testing, <coughs> which is cruel, horrifically cruel for the animals, but it's bad for human health and the environment because all these chemicals end up in the environment. <coughs> Have you seen a film called Earthlings? I have. Um, so I challenge anyone who doesn't have compassion for animals to watch that and go away from those compassion for animals. Or if you've got any, if anyone's got any hard enough friends, make them watch that and change their tune. Um, I'm, I thought that at one point. Um, when I studied veterinary medicine, um, I was the only vegetarian in my, in my class. And I asked the professor if I could take my class to the, to the local abattoir, the slaughterhouse. And we all went there, and there were about seven of us. And most of them just carried on eating meat. They said, yeah, so what? One of them, I think, gave up for about a month and then went back to eating meat. So, you know, some people are really thick-skinned. And in a way, you know, sometimes ignorance is bliss. I think it's people like us who are more compassionate who suffer more because we are aware of the suffering and we take it on, our, on ourselves and we want to do something about it. The people who are thick-skinned and who live only from you know, weekend to weekend um, and just, just, you know, just try and get as much out of life as possible and, and not care about their neighbors or animals, uh, I think they have an easier time on this earth than, than we do. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just wondering about um, animal drugs and how you, for veterinary medicine, how would you go about testing them? Okay, how do we test drugs in veterinary medicine? Sure. Well, it's exactly the same principles as I said before. Uh, it must be species specific. So as a veterinary surgeon, I'm not going to test a drug for parrots on horses. Logical, okay? So if I want to develop a new drug for horses, I'm going to first test it on horse cells, horse tissue culture, horse organ culture, donated horse organs, etc., etc., until I get to the sick horse. And then I'm going to see if I can help that sick horse. I'm not going to take a healthy horse, make that healthy horse deliberately ill, and then see if I can help the horse. No, that's not ethical. So there are ethical ways of testing veterinary drugs. Does that answer your question? Yes, Eddie. Um, that point you made with the you know, uh, fellow researchers going to the abattoir, and of the seven people, the eight people, only one person actually, which, which was yourself, that <coughs> was true to your, you know, your belief. Now, would you say then that maybe if you actually multiply these figures, that only five or six percent of the population, world population, are conscious like we all are? And if that is the case, how do we manage to kind of change what the other 95% is doing and we know it's so wrong? Okay, we're getting very philosophical here. <laughs> um, well, well, there's several ways I can respond to that. The one is to say that, um, and you know, just, just take it for what it's worth and, and pick and choose. One line of thought that I've heard is that some people come into this world simply to experience what it is to live on this material plane what it is to experience taste, food, pain, love, fear, etc., etc., and that's all they want to do. They come into the world simply to experience what it is to live, exist in a material form, and that's it. That's enough for them. They're, you know, they're not going to do any more than that. Then you have people, sort of like the, the group here tonight, who want to do more than that. Not just come here to experience the world and nature and food and pleasures and pain, etc., etc., <coughs> But, but actually to try and heal the world, to, do, you know, to give something back to Mother Nature. So there's, that's, that's one explanation. The other explanation is everything is, is exactly as it's supposed to be. And when you die, you wake up and you think, wow, what a horrible dream. <laughs> okay? Or some people say that God is our dream and we are His or hers. Um, so that's another way to look at it. 
another way to look at it a little bit sort of pessimistic, apocalyptic, is that um, Mother Nature is going to sort this problem out. Okay, tsunamis, earthquakes, global warming, you name it. You know, that's the, because there are not enough of us. You know, there's only this, the 3% or the 4% in the world who care enough. You can't blame people who haven't got enough food on there on the table to eat, okay? We're not talking about those people. We're talking about people who've got plenty of food in their tummy, a roof over their heads, who just don't care. So those people have to be shaken, you know, awoken. Um, now, if you believe that there is a God, then, you know, the, the world is such a mess at the moment. You could say, well, you know, God could have simply sent us an asteroid and just, you know, wipe the slate clean and say, what a horrible experiment, what a horrible failed experiment that was. <laughs> um, but the fact that we are still here now, to me, says that we've been given another chance. We've been given a chance to heal the world, to do something about it. And I think that's really all you can do is, you know, Gandhi said, if you want to change the world, you know, change yourself. Begin with yourself. Don't be judgmental. Don't look around. It's so easy to fall into that trap um, of trying to, you know, change others and, and sometimes it's like hitting your head against the brick wall but, but I think just if you can do your if you can contribute your best to society as an individual and and look after yourself you know try and obviously you can't return your body in the same condition that you were born in but at least return it in a good condition so you know don't abuse your body while you're on earth. Look after yourself so that you can do as much healing as possible while you're here. And then, you know, when your time comes, you return your body to the maker in good condition. You know, good second-hand car. <laughs> <coughs> um, so, are you saying you could imagine a pharmaceutical industry and a health in care industry and such like with zero animal testing? Take it right to the limit. Oh yes, um, animal testing is uh, counterproductive. Okay, there are there are several ways that that animals are used in science. So, for example, they are used to predict whether a drug uh, has what, what the outcome in a human would be or study human diseases, um, or they are used, for example, as spare parts. So, for example, if you're unlucky enough to require a heart valve replacement, you could have a pig heart valve, or you could have a human heart valve, or a synthetic heart valve. Now, a pig heart valve lasts only 10 years, whereas a human heart valve lasts 20 years. So, it makes sense to take the human heart valve. Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he had to have his valve replaced, he went for a human heart valve. So I reckon, you know, with the kind of money he's got, he would have gone for the best. So, so, okay, you could use a pig heart valve, but, you know, it's not the best. Um, you can use animals as factories, as living factories, to produce monoclonal antibodies. Uh, but today we have non-animal methods to do the same thing. So, so there are many different ways in which animals are used in science. Uh, fundamental research is another example where it's just curiosity-driven research. You're not looking for a cure. You just want to see what happens when you pinch you know, the monkey. What does he do? So I'm really focusing tonight only on the prediction argument. I'm saying, not just me, um, more and more scientists are waking up to the fact that if you take into account evolutionary biology and complexity theory, put those together, and those are very, very well-established, firm foundations in science. There is no way that a mouse is going to predict what's going to happen in a, in a human or a cat or a dog. There's just no way that's going to happen. Um, the reason that this, this bad science is stuck is largely thanks to a Frenchman by the name of Claude Bernard, um, who in his day, around 1865, managed to persuade the scientific community that the similarities between animals and people was more important than the differences. So if we pretend that I'm Claude Bernard and you're the audience and I show you a beating dog heart and I say, look at that beating dog heart, looks just like your heart. And you say, hmm, yeah. But what Claude Bernard didn't know is that there are significant 
gender differences between men's hearts and women's hearts, as I explained to you before, and some heart drugs are four times more potent in women than in men. So Claude Bernard was great as a comparative physiologist, superficial. But then you get a guy like uh, Darwin. Darwin was an evolutionary biologist. And Darwin didn't know it at the time, but evolutionary biology trumps, trumps I beg your pardon, comparative physiology. Okay? So Dar um, not Darwin. Claude Bernard was a strict causal determinist, which means, in simple language, if A causes an effect in a monkey, then A will cause the same effect in people. Just, you just have to take into account the, the difference in weight and size. And you know, at the time, it seemed to make sense. Today, we know that's not the case. So when it comes to prediction, we are complex systems. Okay? You can predict, perhaps, what will happen in a one-cell organism but not, not in an organism, not in a complex organism like a human being. And dogs and humans are differently complex. So you, you cannot compare the two. Okay, it's like trying to compare apples and oranges. It doesn't work. Not scientific. Today we have the evidence to prove that. So, as I say, I've been searching this, researching this for 30 years, um, and I'm glad that I've, I've come to the point where I have all these answers and now I know that it's not a scientific issue, it's a political issue, it's an economic issue. The science wins, hands down, no, no, no questions asked. We have the atomic bomb, as far as the science is concerned. The question is, how do you communicate this to politicians, to the general public, against, in the backdrop of the profit motive of the chemical industry? And what I don't understand about the chemical industry is that the, the, the directors have children and grandchildren who are affected by these chemicals. Their children and grandchildren have got 230 chemicals inside their bodies, some of which are cancer-causing. So I, I cannot believe, I, I just find it hard to believe that these people are so self-centered, so egocentric. I mean, if there's one thing that money can't buy, it's health. Okay, it's Steve Jobs, one of the richest men in the world, died of pancreatic cancer a couple of months ago. He, he could afford the best medical treatment in the world, and yet, they couldn't help him. I mean, pancreatic cancer is about the worst kind of cancer you can get. They, with all his millions, he couldn't buy his health. So what I don't understand is that these, these industrialists can be so short-sighted. You know, I, I can understand they don't care about somebody who lives halfway around the globe. But, you know, their children and their grandchildren are eating the same stuff. They're getting, you know, pumped with the same chemicals. And the pollution is affecting everybody. So that's... That, to me, is incomprehensible. Eddie? One last question. Would you say, then, that the cynical chemical companies have a vested interest in making us, making it the environment um, less human, you know, and, and more susceptible to this in effect? Is there a conspiracy against preventative, uh, you know, control of chemicals, period? Or is it just to have a thing that I'm right there? I think that uh, there are many more people, far better qualified than me in this audience, to answer that question. Yes. Because I think, I think that's, that's, you know, <laughs> that's a little bit outside of my... Did you say computer modeling? Yes. Yeah, computer modeling is very important, it's very exciting, and it's one part. It's one part of that tiered testing strategy. When I said cell, cell culture, um, human uh, um, organ slices, etc., etc., and the compartments. So computer modeling features in there. It is part of that. Don't fall into the trap uh, where an animal researcher will say to you, you can't replace an animal with a bunch of cells. You can't replace an animal with a computer model. We never said that a computer model or a bunch of cells uh, is the answer. We say that that is part of a tiered testing strategy. Not to replace the animal, because the animal model doesn't work. 
But if you want to improve your human-based testing method, then incorporate as many stages as possible to protect your first human participant, your first clinical trial. Can you explain organ splicing? Organ slices, not splices. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, it's my South African accent. Slicing, I mean, a slice of organ. That's right. Nice okay. slices. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned homeopathy. Would you care to talk a little bit about that and what you think about it? Um, homeopathy. Homeopathy is interesting because homeopathy recognizes uh, that we are all individuals. So homeopathy already recognized 200 years ago personalized medicine, which is what the pharmaceutical industry is waking up to today. So again, if it works, use it. Some people trash homeopathy, they say it doesn't work. Other people swear by it. But if it works, great. You know. But I would certainly try homeopathy before I try a drug that has severe adverse drug reactions, because at least with homeopathy there's no severe adverse drug reactions. There, aren't, there shouldn't be any adverse reactions. So whatever works. And we know from the pharmaceutical industry that a lot of drugs um, have got a very powerful placebo effect. You know, just the fact that you're swallowing a sugar-coated pill, even though it's got no active ingredient, uh, already has a can have a, a powerful effect on you. In fact, in fact, the, jour the Journal of American Medical Association says that that there is no difference for mild depression, no difference between a placebo and an SSRI. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So there's no difference. So, you know, it makes you think. If they if the Journal of the American Medical Association <coughs> says that, then you know, let's not underestimate the power of the placebo. Um, when when pharmaceutical industries test their chemicals, they have to show that their drug is more potent than a placebo. So if the pl placebo effect is thirty percent and their drug is thirty one percent, they can put their drug onto the market. Okay, or thirty-five percent. That's it's that it's that close. It's that close. Have I exhausted you? <laughs> Other than uh, Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that, what else can we do? Well, that that's I throw that question back at you because um, I've mentioned stalls, info stalls, leafleting. Um, Public talks, less and less, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you could get 200 people to come to a public talk. Today, with all the social networking available, um, you can get your message out far more effectively on Facebook or YouTube. So I think, I think really social networking is the way to go. Uh, we do live in an era of information overload, so it's up to people to be selective um, as to what what is, you know, truth juice, what is true out there. You know, there are a lot of, lot of, lot of rubbish out there as well, so you have, to, you have to sift through the stuff. Who do we lobby? Is it the Home Office or the Health Department or the corporations? All of them? Um, I, at, one, at one point I thought, lobby the politicians. But then I realized... I realized that, well, A, they know nothing. You have to educate them <laughs> on, on animal experimentation. They know nothing. Uh, and B, many politicians, unfortunately, are sort of in the, in the pockets of the, of, the, of the industrialists. I mean, I'll give you an example. In the European Parliament in Brussels, there are 15,000 lobbyists wandering around town at any time. And for every, let's say, animal rights lobbyists that you send to the European Parliament, the industry will send 50. Okay, so, and not only will they do that, they have, they pick four years in advance, before an MEP gets into office, the industry have already started targeting that person, started giving them, you know, grooming them, if you like, before they even get into office. So when we come along two weeks before an important vote in the European Parliament, and talk to these people, that's, we're wasting our time. You know, these people have been well groomed even before they got into office. They're brainwashed, basically. I've talked to a lot of politicians, and it's just like talking to the BBC. It's just pure, pure propaganda. <laughs> it's worse than useless. 
So, so really, I, I'm a firm believer in public opinion. But in order for public opinion, and as you've seen, you know, with the Arab Spring and, and all these, you know, public opinion can sweep away evil. But it has to be informed. And that's, I come back again to this problem of communication. To get this complex message out, what I've given you tonight in, in an hour, you know, I cannot get across in a 20 second soundbite. And most people on a one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, anybody in public relations will tell you, the, the bigger the audience, the simpler the message. The bigger the audience, the simpler the message. So I have got a fairly complex message across to you this evening because you've listened to me very, very patiently and quietly and you've given me enough time to get my argument across to you. I cannot do this with, you know, I'm not Madonna, okay? I can't do it 10 million people in one, in, in, in half an hour jumping up and down on stage. I can't do it. I can't do it. So, there are, there, oh, well, obviously, <laughs> celeb celebrities, we live, yes, we live in a celebrity culture, and if we can get, you know, celebs, and some are on board, you know, you've got celeb vegetarians, you've got celeb vegans, but again, you know, animal experimentation is not a very sexy topic, it's not something easy to sell, it's a hard sell, it's, it's a hard sell, um, so even getting a celeb to, to get that across in 20 seconds is going to be tricky, but, but yes, that's, that's one way of, you know, we live in a celebrity culture, so let's do it. If, um, yeah, if, if, if these lobbyists are attacking these kind of you know, new emerging politicians, um, what about on our Facebook, part of our duty is to make sure these emerging politicians know that they are being lobbied and why, and that we, we are taking that into account. We've got a, a book on them, you know, in the same way as researchers have a book on the animals they destroy. So we actually start to sh proactively target them. So when they evolve and the you know the, the bribes come, etc., they'll know that we know what the, what they're up to. Okay. So in a way, um, go directly to the potential enemy in a sense. Would you say that would be a? I mean, this particular meeting we had very productive, very concise. We just sent a copy of that to them. You know. <coughs> we need to check this I, I think we, we're not we're not paying their salaries though. You know, I think at the end of the, I mean, a lot of people say to me, for example, after a talk, they'll say, you know, what you said made a lot of sense. How come there aren't more people like you out there? You know, what's, what, you know, doesn't seem right. So I say, very simple. You need to have four qualities. You need to be authoritative. So you've got to know what you're talking about. So you've got to be, a, you know, have a science background or be a doctor or something. You've got to be up to date. If I don't spend three to five hours on the internet every day, I'm not up to date anymore. You know, if I get on a debate and I'm asked about the PIP breast implants and why they went wrong, if I don't know the answer, I'm not up to date. Third thing, you've got to be a good communicator. And fourthly, perhaps most importantly, you have to be financially independent. By financially independent, I mean you're either a millionaire or um, you're not dependent on an institution like a hospital or a university because if you are, then you're told in no uncertain terms that if you say, if you speak out against a colleague who does animal experiments, you're out the window. And if you've got a mortgage and three kids, you're going to stum, you're going to be quiet. So um, I think to a large degree, um, we cannot match the lobbying power of the of the you know industrial corporations we just cannot you know for every message that you send that politician he's got 50 from the other side and he's got people in very smart suits actually coming to visit him in person which makes far more of a of an impression than some little email so we, we simply can't match them so that's why as far as the, I mean there are some very very genuine sincere politicians but they again are in a minority are in a minority um, so again, it comes back to, I think, uh, public opinion. And also legal cases. I'm a great believer in legal cases because legal cases are black and white. But the most, one of the most difficult countries to do, to take on a legal case is the UK because of the system. If I want to take on an animal researcher and say to him, why are you not using a non-animal method? Because the law says that if you can get your data without using an animal, you must do so. If I take that person to court, 
the Home Office, because it's going to be a judicial review, it's going to be me versus the Home Office. Who's the judge going to believe? Okay, animal rights scientists or Home Office scientists? So the judge, in good British tradition, will side with the establishment automatically. He'll say, look, you know, I don't know which one of you to believe. I'm not a scientist, you know, so I'm just going to play safe and side with the establishment. Which means that I've got to fork out and pay the lawyers of the Home Office, and they will choose the best lawyers in town. So it's going to cost me between 30,000 and 100,000 pounds. That's going to put me off. Now, there are other countries in the EU, for example, Belgium, where you can do it virtually for, for very little money, which is where I'm, where I'm more active. Because if you get it right in one EU country, you get it right across the board, as was the example with Sweden and Paraquat. So, so every country has got its problems. Okay? Mm -hmm. We tried this in Belgium, and they threw it out of court there because they said there's an old Belgian law that says animal rights organization cannot represent lab animals in court. Now, that's only in Belgium. And so we discovered that to our dismay. So every, pro every country has its problems. The UK is that the money, the money is an issue here because if you lose, you're going you're gonna, to you know, end up selling your house. Um, and they are naturally going to side with the establishment. So, but you, know, you learn from these experiences. You know, if you don't try, you're not going to get anywhere. So one has to probe the system and find the weak links. And, and there are ways, you know, there, there are weak links, and it's up to us to, to find them. But, you know, worst case scenario, God just th sends an asteroid at the Earth, and, and that's, you know, <laughs> end of the story. <laughs> I think, I think it's just a lot of people who are bored, you know, people who, who just sit at home the whole day and they've got nothing better to do. Um, I was just saying, uh, can you give any information about further information for yourself or a website or when you're next doing a talk or anything like that? Um, well, I do school talks quite regularly. Um, if you want to look at the website that. I'm affiliated with, it's called Antidote Europe. So if you just type in Antidote Europe in Google, it'll come up and pretty much everything I've said tonight will be on there except the thing about Asteroid and God. Um, so that's, that's a good sign. And then um, if you're scientifically minded, you can go into PubMed and look up Ray Greek, Dr. Ray Greek, just put in Greek and then R. Uh, and don't misspell that. It's not geek. It's Greek. Mm -hmm. And and that's 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 the highest science. I mean, that is that is the most powerful scientific argument you will get from anywhere. And you can use that against uh, anybody who challenges you on science. Now, if if any of you do info stalls, for example, um, I can send you. If if you contact Caroline, um, she will put you in touch, or I will send her the five questions that most people ask at an info store. I'm talking about animal experimentation now. Okay, so it's always the same five questions roughly. So you will learn what the five answers are. And that answers about 95% of all the questions. Now the other 5% is people who are scientists or doctors or just want to annoy you. And if they ask you very complex scientific questions, you say to them, well, you know, we've got a scientific consultant just give me your email and, and our scientific consultant will get in touch with you. And I will. I will answer them. Now, if they're honest and sincere, they'll say, okay, here's my email address. Please get in touch. And I will very happily uh, and gladly answer them. So that, that covers you 
for that 5% that you really cannot uh, answer, if it's somebody who's, who's got a, a science background. Do you have any leaflets that give the five answers that you'd like to choose? Yeah. Um, I don't think I have them in the... I mean, there are a lot of leaflets out there similar, but what I could do is, if I send, if I send this stuff to Caroline, I mean, you could just print it off, yeah. off you know, your computer. It's, it's half a page or a page. Mm -hmm. That's it. Perhaps we could put that up on the um, Brisbane Rights Collection website so people can use assessments. You've been a lovely audience. One more question. One more question. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is well known and well established that uh, the recent uh, climate change is anthropogenic because mm. due to the uh, like uh, greenhouse gases emissions from uh, like industrial activities and stuff. Uh, how about uh, and the vast majority of scientists agree on that? There might be one or two percent who are like. Uh, paid by the corporations, like all the corporations and stuff. But uh, how is that uh, um, in the uh, animal testing? How how many? How what the percentage of scientists agree that uh, animal testing doesn't work? Ah, it's, it's very difficult for us to know that because, as I explained to you before, if a scientist is against animal experimentation, but that scientist works at an institution like a hospital or a university. They will keep quiet because there are of more prominent scientists that uh, uh, like are pro proponents of uh, alternative uh, animal testing techniques. There's a, there's a difference between opposing animal experimentation on prediction grounds and promoting, you know, alternatives. There's a, there's a difference there. First of all, because of institutional intimidation, most scientists don't don't want to express themselves in public. Um, there are a few scientists like, for example, Dr. Greek, who is financially independent and he speaks his mind. But a professor, uh, most professors got to where they are because they've published 300 papers. Now the easiest way to publish a paper is to get a rat injected at one end and a paper comes out of the other end. <laughs> That's how they publish papers. So, so unfortunately the easiest way to publish is to use animal tests. So, so it, you will be hard pressed to find a university professor who will openly come out against his colleagues because that's what that's what he's, he'll end up doing. He'll be speaking against his colleagues, and he'll put he'll be putting his career on the line. So it's very very rare to find that. Very rare. So there are some out there, but you can't measure how many because most of them are, keep, are keeping quiet because of institutional intimidation. Eddie. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, the question of the amount of animals that destroy animal um, experimentation, you know, pales into insignificance compared to the animals that we abuse and we eat. Whether it's whether it's halal meat or religious, you know, um, butchering, etc. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically. Because your first, your opening, um, you know, comparison with the seven people you took to, I mean, that wasn't an animal experimentation, that was about eating animals, you know what I mean? So, basically, how do we even start, you know, attacking that group of people that will, you know, eat animals without any, any conscience or any, um, you know, remorse? I think the best, the best <laughs> example is, is you be an example. In other words, the fact that you're making a statement by not eating animals, and, and people notice that, and uh, lead by example, that's, that's all I can say. Um, but I think that people are eating less meat because they are being made aware of the health benefits of cutting down on meat. I mean, I, I think it's only very recently, in the last sort of year or two, that you read in the Times, um, you know, the effects of global warming because of factory farming, the fact that processed meats are linked to cancer. I mean, that is becoming mainstream. I think meat consumption is going down, not because people want to give it up, but because they, they, they want to preserve their health. Totally, 
egocentric reasons, but who cares? You know, the overall result is a decrease in meat consumption and dairy consumption as well. I didn't hear that. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the Chinese and the Indians take on our bad habits before they take on our good habits. So, uh, yes, they're trying to catch up to us and own a car uh, and a DVD and, and eat meat and foie gras and stuff like that because, you know, they, they want to they wanna copy us in the West. But um, I think that they, they are going to suffer the effects, like everybody else, of global warming, of landslides. Um, I mean, China, I think, is becoming so polluted. You know, we have a, we have a very nice arrangement with China. Uh, the, the UK imports monkeys from China for animal experiments, and we export our waste. Okay, we send, we send container ships to China because we don't have enough <coughs> landfills in this country for our waste. So the Chinese very kindly are taking on our waste. So all that waste is going to end up in their underground water. It's going to pollute. I mean, China, I know China is huge, but, you know, the effects of global warming, pollution, etc., etc., it's affecting everybody. So, yes, they are taking on our bad habits, but I think they will reap the, the effects of those bad habits as well. Yeah, I, 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 there was there was a, a survey taken by Safer Medicines campaign. About 82% of doctors said that they were uncomfortable with animal testing. But I mean, actually, medical doctors and vets know very little about animal experimentation. If you ask them, is a chimpanzee immune to HIV, they won't know the answer. Okay, the chimpanzee is our closest animal relative, with whom we share about 98% of our DNA. That's the best animal model we have. And the chimpanzee is immune to HIV, hepatitis, and malaria. And those are three diseases that kill millions of people every year. The chimpanzee is immune to those diseases. So if that's the best animal model we have, what does that say about rats, mice, cats, dogs, etc.? But the truth is that the doctors, um, you know, learnt medicine when they were in, in medical school 30 years ago. And everything else that they know about medicine is what they learn when they go to conferences largely sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. Any more questions? Okay, big thanks to Andre. Right?